I mean, can can you sue people? I don't. Have you tried doing any of that? No. I mean, we got we have, we have a lawsuit with a we, guy we have, who have, made have, like three thousand videos. Three thousand videos. Three thousand unique. Wherever you are, bang your chest, brother. You're a fucking G. Three thousand videos. That's what you do, man. Immigrant mentality. Well done, brother. Again, if you're gonna critique stand up or my fight picks or my, whatever my football picks, all good. That's what the internet's for. Now, if you're gonna go out there in uh, defamation, like you if you're know, gonna go out there in defamation, is hits hilarious. his kids or beats his wife, well, then you got my attention. I'm gonna come after you. Oh, yeah, that, that game I don't play, and the guy's suffering from that. So, Mark Twain famously said, "It's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open it and remove all doubt." Exactly. Five days ago, Brendan Shaw appeared as a guest on the Hot Breath Comedy Network with Joel Byers for a 40-minute interview. They discuss everything from Shorb's online hate and his lawsuit against a YouTuber, how Shorb does his business, he commented on Rogan's Spotify deal and the mechanics behind it, and they also reflected on his own comedy career. Now, I've never heard of Joel Byers before I saw this interview. He's a comedian who's been working for over a decade. I watched some of his stand-up just here on YouTube while I was preparing, and he seems like a pretty down-to-earth and genuine guy. Hey, I've been doing comedy over 10 years. And it is a dream job if you hate money. <laughs> like seriously, I, I have a podcast called Hot Breath and I've interviewed over 400 comedians on there and the top three tips have been write jokes, get on stage, and marry someone with a job. <laughs> wow, he's actually funny. He's actually quite funny. He actually is, looks quite decent on stage looks quite comfortable and here he is getting advice from fucking brendan about stand-up and his career man dark times look his comedy is a bit safe for me but his interviewing skills were really impressive he didn't hold back he asked some tough questions and he caught bupper out a few times so I'm going to leave Joel out of this video. He's not the subject of my criticism here. In fact, I appreciate that he produced this interview because it stopped me in my tracks and revealed Brendan Schaub's true character. Almost everything Bapa says in this interview is either factually incorrect, misleading, or completely incoherent. Wow. Now, for my regulars watching, you will have noticed that in the last couple of months, I've been easing up on Bapa Probably. and focusing on some other podcasters and comedy hacks. Mm -hmm. I've said multiple times that he seems to be improving in his self-awareness, some of his takes have been decent, and I even used some of his clips recently to support my own arguments. Some of you didn't like that, but I always give credit where credit is due, but that goes both ways. So this video is going to be a little bit different to my usual videos. I'm going to show you guys why Brendan Schaub is a complete idiot. Firstly, I'm going to show you why, in my opinion, he... Some of his headshots are fucking hilarious, man. Some of his headshots are fucking hilarious. <laughs> look at me, the Rolex. Of, look at the... Oh, he's fucking... He's a funny guy. He's a funny guy. He's a funny guy. We'll lose his lawsuit against that YouTuber. In fact, this interview itself, in my opinion has enough evidence to completely ruin Bapa's case. Jesus Again, Christ. this is just my opinion as a former lawyer. There you go. Something else you guys didn't know about me. Oh, really? But I'm also going to show you why Brendan Schaub is a terrible businessman and fact check some of his claims that he makes about Joe Rogan and his Spotify deal, which are completely false, baseless, and ignorant. Basically, it seems like Bapa can't do basic maths, and when you combine that with his confidence, you have a classic Dunning-Kruger masterclass on display. And then finally, I'll show you why his comedy career is completely fake. Bapa reveals the details behind how he got famous without any talent, how Joe Rogan leaving LA has materially affected his comedy career, and I'll even show you the part where Joel asks him why he hasn't performed at Rogan's comedy club yet. <laughs> classic. So, like I said... This video is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little longer than usual. So I've posted timestamps in the description and in the comments. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. So you can get the... F don't edge me, don't edge me, don't edge me. I want you to control and not letting the negativity get to you. I mean, I have to. Otherwise, you know, I drive my, you know, my TRX off of the PCH. You know, off oh, the PCH. Yes. Like my TRX. I mean, it's, 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 it's a Dodge truck. It's not much of a flex. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say like Lamborghini. Or it's still a truck. I'm a blue collar guy here. Yeah. Blue collar guy is you know? hilarious. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah blue collar guy. Look at the car he's got. It's a Porsche GT, Porsche 911 GTRS, GT2 RS. Beautiful car. Listed price two hundred ninety three thousand dollars. Working class guy. Blue so, yeah, guy. but what else are you can do? Stop? Quit? No, no, that's not me. That's not never gonna happen. But have you done anything to try to like, um, like suppress this or like get on top of it? Like it's just what do you? Uh, no, there's nothing you can do. I mean, can can you? Yeah, you know, you know the vibes, Uche. We are gooning over here, bro. We are gooning. You know, you don't even you don't even want to know what's in that corner of the room over there. You don't even want to know what goes down over there. You don't want to know. What happens when I turn on those red LEDs down there? You don't want to know. Lock up your kids. <laughs> Sue people? I don't. Have you tried doing any of that? No. I mean, we got we we have a lawsuit with a guy who made like three thousand videos. Again, if you're gonna critique stand up or my fight picks or my, whatever my football picks, all good. That's what the internet's for. Uh -huh. Now, if you're gonna go out there and uh, I love how he's giving us permission on what we can criticize him for. I give you permission to criticize my fight picks <laughs> and my stand up. But anything else, you are not allowed. A defamation, like, you know, whatever Brendan hits his kids or beats his wife, oh. well, then you got my attention, I'm going to come after you. Oh, yeah, that, that game I don't play. And the guy's suffering from that. So some, sh some would say he probably needs to beat his kids and his wife, to be fair. Some people would say that. Some people could say that to get them in line. Some people could say that. I don't say that, but some people could. That is whatever. But, you know, the internet's always going to internet. There's nothing you can do to combat that. Who's but, a comedian? You know, I'm in the business of likability. Ooh. So when I go on the road, the I'm... The most unlikable guy. I think, too, for younger comics or people yeah. getting into this, you think that the internet through all the comments or whatever it is is real. They are it's kind of. It's not real, man. They I make are. a business of likability. I have, I don't know, 10 endorsement deals? That's, oh, that's how I pay my bills. Do you get endorsement deals because you're likable? Or do you get endorsement deals because you have a platform worthy of people putting deals on there and if that if that platform that you have has been propped up mostly because of your friendship with rogan can you say that's because of your likability if you are demonstrably unlikable again I, I, my theory is that brendan might be one of the only people in content generation maybe he's a part of a small community of them who probably has more haters than fans more legit haters than fans i feel like because you can't even sell out comedy bars and shit like a, la a literal comedy club with like 50 tables he can't sell out so clearly the demand to see him isn't what it used to be so the r actual fans who are willing to pay aren't there i think there's more haters than fans i think so i have 10 endorsement deals uh and this isn't a flex it's just also i love how you're saying 10 endorsement deals like as if he's an athlete you got what you mean podcasts and stuff like you got 10 endorsements no, do you showing you that right you know i'm more loved than i am liked you know i go to a coffee shop i can't i can't i was just with my brother i can't go anywhere without meeting nice people man. oh my god why would you say that i'm the most i can't go to a coffee shop without he won't just really say i can't leave my house without somebody recognizing me wow the ego the hubris i can't go outside without some come on come on come on you know, mm -hmm. who, who love what I do. And then also, I sell tickets on the road. That's how else I pay my mortgage. You, you know? don't sell tickets, So that, that stuff is real. You don't that's sell tickets, though. Attainable. I see the, and meet those people. So I think that's what helps me navigate through all the darkness. So because you don't see people online, what they have to say doesn't... Honestly, if that was me, I'd, I, I, my brain would explode. If there's a million, millions of YouTube videos out there saying how much of a redact I am, getting millions of views, millions of likes, I might want to take a look in the mirror and say... Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe they onto something. I mean, they might be hating. Maybe there's some truth in it. Maybe. Okay, I'm going to get straight into this now. If I'm Bupper's hey. lawyer, I would be on the phone to him right now telling him that this interview needs to be deleted immediately. Yep. And I'm not even joking a little bit. Here's why. In the first part of that clip, he says that it's okay to criticize him over the stuff he says on his podcasts, such as his fight picks for boxing and MMA or his football picks, and that's straight up false. Private exactly. citizens do not need permission to criticize public figures. Exactly. That's protected by the First Amendment, and it's been well established and held up time and time again by the United <laughs> States Supreme Court. But here's where it gets interesting. 
He went on to say that criticism is okay until it comes to things like his wife and kids. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually agree with that. I think it's poor form to criticize innocent bystanders, even if they're related to a degenerate like Brendan Schaub. But However, that's a personal view that I share with Bubba, exactly. not a legal view. Exactly. Because what he's saying there is not protected by law. He effectively created his own legal standard because <laughs> he's got hurt feelings. This is quite common in the legal world and it gets very expensive very quickly for guys like Bupper with that kind of attitude and money to burn. Oh, I didn't know that. So there are actually, there's Redax out there who file lawsuits because they feel like their feelings got hurt, but there's no legal standing. So what do you do if you're, if you're a lawyer and you know he hasn't got a case, you just take the case on and, and bank the money. That doesn't make any sense. If you know the person's had no case, how can you even put the case forward? And this is where we get to the smoking gun. This is the bit that his lawyers will be fuming over. You know, I'm in the business of likability. So when I go on the road, I'm, I think too, for younger comics or people getting into this, you think that the internet through all the comments or whatever it is, is real. It's not real, man. I make a business off likability. <laughs> I have, I don't know, 10 endorsement deals? That's, that's how I pay my bills. I have 10 endorsement deals. Uh, and this isn't a flex. It's just showing you that right. you know, I'm more loved than I am liked. You know, I go to a coffee shop. I can't. I, can't, I was just with my brother. I can't go anywhere without meeting nice people, man, you mm -hmm. know, who, who love what I do. And then also, I sell I tickets on the road. That's how else I pay my mortgage. I am Kanye. You know? So that, that stuff is real. That's attainable. I see the, and meet those people. So I think that's what helps me navigate on, through all Brendan, the darkness. Bro. Now, I don't know all the details about this lawsuit. All I'm going off is that Shorb said that it's a defamation case against a YouTuber for saying false things about his wife and kids, etc. Uh -huh. So in these types of defamation lawsuits, there's an element that the plaintiff needs to prove to the court uh -huh. called serious harm or actual harm. It just depends which jurisdiction you're in, but the concept is broadly the same across the spectrum. Bubba would need to demonstrate actual harm or damages resulting from the defamatory statement. Oh. This could include financial losses or damage to reputation, but it has to be a measurable negative consequence. He just clearly outlined right there that even though there are these voices on the internet criticizing him and his family, it has no, not had any material offense. impact on his real world. Oh, he no. <laughs> Oh no, Papa, another own goal. This is a case for all locales, isn't it? Because I think Brendan definitely is a locale. All locales are their biggest detractor. They hate the trolls and the haters, but most locales are their own biggest detractors. They're their own worst enemies. They give people content to kind of take the piss out of them for, willingly, and they purposely shoot themselves in the foot again and again and again. He's still selling tickets. He's still meeting nice people day in, day out. In fact, he literally said his day-to-day -day interactions with his fans are overwhelmingly positive. Basically, he outlined how there is no serious harm or actual damages. They were just words online, it seems. Jesus Christ. Bro, that's not defamation. That's just hurt feelings. An example of defamation would be if he saw a noticeable... He's NJ Ranger. He's the best. He's the local in the best physical shape. I'll give him that. Now, I think, uh, I think, would you say Thing is in a better shape than him? What's his face? Um, Black DSP. What's his name? The, the black guy that's always screaming and shouting and cussing people when he's on Street Fighter. Uh, what's his name again? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? He He's in good shape, no? He works out a bunch. Forgot his name dip in his ticket sales and him and his family receive backlash from the public in their day-to-day -day lives that's the ltg ltg yeah ltg low tier god yeah maybe bapper and low tier god are the most in shape locales they had trouble leaving the house etc but according to him there's nothing and don't be mistaken this interview that he just gave can be used as evidence in court 100 percent he was clear, he was Dumb. measured, and to me, it seemed like a credible statement Come and an on, accurate Brandon, assessment bro, of his public doing, life. Man. But it gets worse. 
because as a public figure, the bar for defamation is much higher than just between two private nobody citizens. Makes sense. There's this thing called actual malice, and it only applies to defamation cases involving public figures. It was established to safeguard the First Amendment rights of free speech and free press. Yo, look at Podcast Cringe flexing his previous um occupation fucking skill sets and knowledge amazing look at him lawyer bay so get this it was introduced specifically to prevent public figures from easily suing private citizens like this case exactly now the difference is brendan shaw will have to show that the youtuber in question believed at the time that the statements they made were false it's not enough to show that the statements themselves were false no no this is different this is actual malice. He has to show that the other guy knew himself that what he was saying wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, how is he going to prove that? How is Bapa going to prove what some random YouTuber was thinking at the time he was making a video? Come on, look. Basically, whenever you're involved in a legal case, the number one rule is that you don't talk about it in public. Exactly. So what does Bapa do? Just he goes and does an interview and completely wrecks his case by admitting it was a case of hurt feelings stupid. and has no legal basis stupid. in defamation stupid, law. Stupid. Like I said, though, this is just my legal opinion, having seen so many of these cases in the United States in the past. Now, my final word on this lawsuit business is this. We all know what happened to Louis C.K. in 2017. I've covered that in detail on this channel previously. Louis almost lost $40 million as a result of the allegations from five women, which were published in the New York Times at the end of 2017. Now, hypothetically, if it subsequently came out that those women were all lying and they fabricated those allegations to bring Louis down and wreck his reputation, now that would be an open and shut case of defamation, a, a clear cut case of defamation. Even though I agree that commenting on Bapa's relationship with his wife and kids is out of line, what he's talking about is just hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move into why Brendan Schaub is a terrible businessman who can't do basic maths or use Google. I think I've heard you say that <laughs> your you, your business isn't run by like what's going to make money. Like you said, you don't make decisions based on like what's going to make the most money. Never. Never. So it's, now that's different when I have employees because then sometimes I have to do certain things where I would never agree to because mm. I know it's going to bring in this certain amount of money. I'm like, all right, it's more work for me, but everyone's going to eat. All good. I'm done for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I never go. Oh. More work for me. We just saw a video of Chin being in the studio from nine till nine recording, editing, clipping, all this sort of shit. What does he do really? He probably works max how many hours a week? Brendan. Six? Maybe charitable, maybe we give him 10. If that, come on, bro. More work. Like, you don't do anything. He probably does more work in his house. He probably does more work around his house than he does actually in the studio. He probably does more work at his uh, around his house than in the actual studio. Chin does everything. Chin and that, guy, that Casey guy do everything. All he does is sit in front of a microphone with his coffee, maybe with a dash of whiskey in there, and talk. He does absolutely nothing. Oh, let's do this because I know it's going to be the cool, trendy thing to, and to make a ton of money. No, that's not the business I'm in, ever. All right, this is actually pretty funny. So basically, <laughs> what we got from that clip is car. that Brendan Schaub does- That's a fucking lovely fucking car, though. Lovely fucking car. ...and structure his business and content creation around making money. Instead, it's all about just creating good quality content to entertain his fans and have good conversations. Is that about right? Did you guys get that from what he just yeah, said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's continue. What is the, so what is like the structure of like, like a podcast, like monetizing a podcast? And, and I've also never understood personally for me, I've, I've said this before, and I don't know if this is a thing to say, but I've never understood why he wants to look like a former footballer or something. Like, he buys cars and dresses in a way where you'd think he owns like a beverage company. Like he owns like, I don't know, like he owns Happy Dad or something, right? Like he's got stakes in some betting. Like, you know what I mean? He, 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 he has material possessions of, of, of a guy that you'd think has multiple fucking properties that they lease out and rent and shit. When really all he does is he's got like a mediocre podcast with a really nice audience and that's about it and not a really that good, you know, comedy career. I've always thought his lifestyle and his things that he owns 
just bring unwanted attention. It kind of reminds me of that quote from Elon Musk when he went on Joe Rogan. I think it was really smart. People took the piss out of him, but Joe asked him something like, oh, why don't you have like a big mansion or something along those kind of lines? And he was like, it just, it's an attack vector. Obviously now he likes being a troll. He likes leading into it. But he said like, it's an attack vector. The more nice things I get, it gives more people, it gives more people an opportunity. It gives them more things to attack me for. Because people already hate me because I've got money, I'm rich, whatever, I'm smart, whatever. But then when you keep buying lavish things, when you buy the big island, when you have the skyscraper, when you have the fucking 17 Porsches, people end up hating you more. But I just think for Brendan, that will be the case. And I also just think for the level of personality he is, it just doesn't make any sense. Like why do you, why are you like living life as if like you're a retired NFL star? a retired NFL quarterback or you've got like a hit show on ESPN when you're just like a podcast dude you don't need to be having all those things you know what I mean really but hey maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way but I always thought it's just an, an unnecessary thing to like have in your life because it seems like you're you're very savvy at like okay advertising but then you also seem to have merch figured out and then also like Patreon like yeah. what, are, what are the streams that you build to like elevate a show yeah, it's all, so it's all an ecosystem right because you have your your podcast or your podcast network mm -hmm. uh which people will tune into you know every week every day hopefully if you're doing it right but then and then that promotes the comedy so it's like it, they, they go hand in hand because the better your podcast doing the more tickets you're selling so the, the that's in that ecosystem and then with me i bet he probably makes way more money with content than he does with stand-up stand-ups probably just make more money but I'd say for the his monthly income, probably the majority of it comes from podcasting. I can't think a lot of it comes from stand up, because I, I I believe the unique thing. I think what unique said about Brendan paying for gigs is true because it happens in the DJ world. In the DJ world, if you have friends in high places, you can especially you can basically play in most nightclubs if you want to pay for free. If you're willing to put yourself up in a hotel, if you're willing to book yourself flights. If you're good and if they like you, whatever, and you kind of befriend them, you can play most clubs without getting paid because promoters would love to have a DJ that can play for two hours before the fucking, you know, as, as a warm up before the main person comes on for free. Why not? And just pay you in drinks. They fucking love that. So that's possible. So I'm sure that's the case in stand up also. I'm sure in stand up, because you want to appear like you're a success and because I'm assuming, again, because, you know, there's always this, the fake it till you make it thing is real unfortunately i know it is because people do it so much so my feeling is that if people are buying views they're doing it because it's a reason at the moment now with these live streamers on kick and, and rumble they do this thing where they bought live stream views right where they buy i'm assuming you can buy packages of like live stream viewers so it makes you look like you're way more popular than you are so i'm sure they're doing that for a monetary reason if you have loads of live viewers you can probably leverage that to get other deals so i'm sure in the pod in the stand-up world there is something about having a calendar on your website with dates and stuff that helps you with other things i don't know what it is because i'm not a stand-up i'm not involved in that industry but i'm sure there's something to it because that would explain why somebody like a brendan would pay to have a gig in a club like how i would hire a nightclub to do a party you hire a night you hire a club because when you come up to it as being a dj you can obviously start just djing in the bedroom but if you want to dj in clubs and stuff you can basically just hire spaces put on your own parties and book yourself and then kind of get your name out that way because no one's really going to book you because they don't fucking know who you are but if you build up your own party you can kind of do it that way so i'm sure it happens in stand-up too you just have somebody you just call up a club and i guess you hire the spot and perform and you can also sell tickets but it's not like they're booking you it's like you just booked them to do a show that it looks good on your on your website because it's a professional place you know um i think that's the case i think so me i think during covid i realized it even before then but you know when it comes to podcast reads there's so much more you can do with that it could because the podcast read is just an audio read and they might get some return but you know even i fast forward through the ads so it's like this can't be a good when i when someone talks to me like well here's 20 grand for a read you know for for this month i'm like you're not gonna see your money, man. I'm telling you, you're not gonna get. You're not gonna sell twenty thousand dollars in underwear. Like you, <laughs> you know, you might be good for brand association, but you're not gonna get that money. So, my deals now, I I have Brendan the fucking humanitarian, right? <laughs> Brendan the saint. <laughs> He's turning that money. Hey, man, I, don't give me twenty k for your bullshit underwear startup. You're not gonna get that back, bro. 
Yeah, right. You don't. I don't believe that. In the, I don't believe that in the slightest. Those obviously we have the podcast reads, but now it's more of a three sixty deal where it includes social media, whether it's the finding the kids social media, golden hour social media, my social media, my independent endorsements will trickle into the show. So it's this whole ecosystem where it's just not predicated on a certain amount of views you're getting stuff like that. So they're getting the biggest bang for their buck. Mm -hmm. And so it's not predicated also, you know, cause summer's a slow time for podcasts, you know, or predicated on, we have this huge guest, let's make sure we do this. So it's, it's just a way to kind of ride the waves where it's not this, these ups and downs. Right, I see. Wow. So basically, right after he explained how he doesn't do things for money, he goes into intricate detail about how he's created a promotional ecosystem with his podcast network so he can sell more tickets to his comedy shows. And then he explains how he uses his social media accounts in tandem with his podcasting network to make it more effective and profitable exactly. for his advertisers. Exactly. Well, it's all an ecosystem, right? Because you have your, your podcast or your podcast network, mm -hmm. uh, which people will tune into you know every week every day hopefully if you're doing it right but then and then that promotes the comedy so it's like it, the, the, they go hand in hand because the better your podcast doing the more tickets you're selling my deals now i i have those obviously we have the podcast reads but now it's more of a 360 deal where it includes <laughs> social media whether it's the finding the kids social media golden hour social media my social media whenever somebody says they're in a 360 deal most likely it's because they want the money in music, that's this thing that happens a lot, right? People, music artists get exploited by record labels all the time in 360 deals. And usually whenever they ask a musician, hey, why do you sign a 360 deal? You know how bad they are. There's all this information out there about how exploitative they are, how un, you know one-sided they are, and how fucking scammy they are and downright evil they are. So especially nowadays, they fucking, they're taking a bit of your merch and your ticket sales and shit. They just say, because I need the money. So record labels prey on that. They prey on the starving artist and they want to, they give you a hundred K up front. You take a hundred K because you don't have any money, but then, you know, later down the line, you end up paying back way more than that hundred K in interest and shit. And they own you for a very long time. And you, you know what I mean? Like, so it's funny in the podcast world, how he's saying that he doesn't do stuff for money, but he's in the, he's in a voluntary 360 deal <laughs> where he probably went to these advertisers and says, Hey, look at my, I know you can't give me good rates for my podcast alone because my audio isn't king and my numbers aren't good, but look at my Instagram. That's what he probably did, right? Because of the whole podcast bubble bursting, most likely there's not enough, there's not as much ad money going around as it was before in the past. So probably now he includes his, his social media platforms as a, another option in the deal. So if the podcast numbers aren't great, hey, here's my social media. Put your shit on here. Let's go to the moon. And let me buy another Porsche. My independent endorsements will trickle into the show. So it's Rain, this whole ecosystem drink. where it's just not predicated on a certain amount of views you're getting, stuff like that. So they're getting the biggest bang for their buck. I think I've heard you say that you're, you, your business isn't run by like what's going to make <laughs> money. Like you said you don't make decisions based on like what's going to make the most money. Never. Never. So doesn't that mean that his whole ecosystem is set up to make money? Exactly. Hmm. Maybe I've just misunderstood the genius of Brendan Schaub. Unfortunately, though, when he started talking about Rogan and his Spotify deal, he fully Mark Twained himself. After I play this clip, I'm going to use the latest advanced technology to show you that Bubba is completely wrong, that he states incorrect facts and pretends to be a smart business shark. You may have heard of it. It's called Google. I don't know. I'm just, I'm seeking your guidance here as like, you've seemed to have figured out like the media side of this podcasting game. And now I'm looking to elevate this podcast really into a show. Yep. So I'm really looking to like getting. I, yeah. And I think that's CG. something you have to do because I think, you know, we've been doing Fire Kid for 12 years. When we start in Brian's garage, you're at th almost 13 years. I love how this is, this is a constant thing you see on the Fire Kid subreddit. People poking fun and really honing in on this thing that he does i don't know why he lies about how long he's been doing the podcast because he still started earlier than most people he always gets the date even with his stand-up career he does the same thing he might be like if he's seven years in he'll say he's nine years in if the podcast is 10 years old he'll say he's 13 years old it's like why does it matter really obviously he wants to make it look like he's an og and he's been in it since the beginning but the numbers are the numbers. It doesn't matter. The fact that you get make a living talking into a microphone and it shows as shit as it is still to this day, that's the win. It doesn't matter when you did it. The fact that you're still around now should be the best thing 
ever. You should pat yourself on the back for that. But the unnecessary lying about when it was founded and shit is just weird. And again, more evidence that he's a pathological liar. There's now. So when we started, everyone, their gay aunt didn't have a podcast. Like, you know, there's no uh, level to entry. There's no barrier. So mm -hmm. anybody can People do it. Because of Rogan, People see the success aunt. of shows, whatever show you're into, oh. and they go, I can talk. I can do that. So they do it. doesn't mean it's me successful. So now it's, it's oversaturated. And, and especially in the past year, the podcast bubble burst. The Spotify deals, they lost their ass. Not on Rogan. They saved their ass on Rogan. They're lucky they signed Joseph Rogan. And I don't, idea. Rogan and I will argue about this. I'm going to. He got underpaid. Hmm. He, he, you, you, you look at the, the valuation of their stock and how much that company is worth now. Cause that's insane to say because I don't think there's a single podcast out there that's making back the money that Spotify invests in them. Even Call Her Daddy. Maybe Call Her Daddy's might be the exception because he, she does live shows and shit. But Joe Rogan podcast, if we're believing what Bert said and we're believing what other people said who've got big mouths, he got anywhere between 100 million and 300 million from Spotify to license his podcast for that period of term that it was out there's no way spotify made their money back on that even a hundred even a low estimate 100 million there's no way spotify made back 100 million worth in ads or signups no fucking way because if they did spotify wouldn't have laid off half didn't recently before the layoffs they did recently where they let go of like fifteen thousand people so um uh 101,500 people before that, if I'm not mistaken, didn't they completely scrap the podcast division? I'm pretty sure the whoever the woman was who signed Meghan Markle and Harry Prince Harry to Spotify for their pod, they got fired. So the main person who signed them got fired. The podcast division got completely scrapped. Spotify wouldn't do that if they made money. You don't fire people and get rid of complete entire divisions, right? Because you're doing well. <laughs> so i don't think there's any podcast honestly even the cooler daddy i'm thinking about it, i don't think there's a single podcast that can make back the investment that podcast please drop from put into because i think they put their money into just for acquisition because if you're if you're spotify you sign rogan because you want more spotify premium subscribers and you want more ads right because ads basically pay so you want more advertisers to want to advertise on your platform because you have all the eyes and the ears on there. They want to get whatever product service in front of you. I just don't think there's enough people out there to sign up to Spotify. Who haven't been, who, there's not enough people out there who don't already have Spotify that are going to sign up just to listen to Rogan. And there's also not enough advertisers out there that would make up the difference of what you paid them. It's just not going to happen. It's just too much money, unfortunately. It's good for Rogan, but for the, the streaming platforms, it's near on impossible to make that money back. They signed Rogan compared to what they paid him. You know, I, I'm a, a shark when it comes to business. Maybe unless you're like one of those gambling places, right? Kick and stuff. Maybe you can do it on kick because you've got like a gambling angle as well. That that might that might work because you're making money through that business of um, stake and shit. But I think most streaming platforms who sign people onto these exclusive deals, you sign them on just because of acquisition. You're kind of make, you're doing it at a loss. You're do, you're signing them on for their audience, really. That's what, and for the free marketing, whatever it may be, the brand exposure, but you're not really going to make your money back on those deals. They underpaid my man. He, they underpaid. He should got paid a lot more. All good. All good. That's his thing. You know, I still, I would done the deal. I'm just saying, you look how much that company. Didn't he say he, he wasn't, he didn't care about money. And now he's, I just noticed that as well. He didn't care about money, but he would have taken more money. Cool. It's evaluated now. And then you look at the money they tossed, uh, the Obamas, that uh, woke so boy, um, what's woke his name? Boy. And, uh, Prince Harry and uh, oh, Meghan Markle. So, yeah. You look at all these shows, uh, shows that I'm, and the other shows I'm fans, so I won't say them. They've all lost their on that, like except what show? for Joseph Rogan. Also calling, him Joseph Rogan is, also, calling him Joseph Rogan is so fucking G-A-Y. Honestly, it's so G-A-Y. Joseph Rogan, you know. Put it towards him, you know, and, and sign a longer deal because his deal's up soon. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think it was a three-year deal. Good luck with that. Three-year, 100 million? I don't yeah. think it's free. It's much longer than that, man. Right? <laughs> I don't think it's free. But, but even that, he, he was, was making, he and people are like, oh, my free. God, so much money. Uh -huh. He was know. making, uh, you know, I don't want to give away his finance. I mean, he was making good amount of money, but it's not like that's far off from what he's doing on his own. Yeah. 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 So I guess there is, there's a, if I could get the middle class of podcasting, I'm fine with it. Yeah. You know, hell yeah. Middle yeah. class, good living. All righty then. Let's do some fact checking. 
First of all, Bupper clearly knows nothing about Rogan's Spotify deal because we all know that it's worth north of $200 million, not the $100 million that was initially quoted, uh -huh. which is what Bupper just quoted himself. Okay, but what about his other claim? You, re you, you look at the, the valuation of their stock and how much that company is worth now because they signed Rogan compared to what they paid him. You know, I, I'm a, a shark when it comes to business. They underpaid my man. So if I just jump over to Google and type in what was Spotify's share price on September 1, 2020, which is when Rogan had his first week officially on Spotify. All right, it says $291.75. So now if I type in what was Spotify's <laughs> share price on Friday, it says $192.17. Hmm, okay, I'm not very good at math, so I'm going to go over to ChatGPT now and say... <laughs> is $291.75 bigger than $192.17? Yes. I love okay, by how much? $99.58. Hmm. Okay, million. so then how much smaller is the second number than the first number in percentage terms? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, the second number is approximately 34% smaller than the first number. Hmm, I see. You, re you, you look at the, the valuation of their stock and how much that company is worth now because they signed Rogan compared to what they paid them. You know, I, I'm a, a shark when it comes to business. They underpaid my man. Okay, so Brendan Business Shark Shorb got me thinking about this idea that Rogan saved Spotify and created all of this value for them. So being the nerd that I am, I decided to dive into their financials and see if I could figure out how much of an impact Joe Rogan has actually had on oh, Spotify's business go. model. Be good. Here's what I found. In a section explaining the risks related to their business model, I found this interesting sentence. In order to increase our advertising revenue, we seek to increase the listening time that our users spend on our service or find new opportunities to deliver advertising to users on the service, such as through podcasts and other opportunities relating to content promotion to users. So basically, the revenue that Spotify gets from podcasts is based primarily off of advertising. Then I thought, well, how much of Spotify's revenue comes from ad Exactly what I said, isn't it? Exactly what I said earlier. Um, I think it's always been like that, though, isn't it? I don't think I'm, I'm the only one to say it. I think it's always been the case. I think most people understood that the podcast boom thing and the deals, they were mostly weighted for the podcaster like it was most it, it was in joe but it was in joe but it was in joe rogan's favor the deals most of the deals are for podcasters they're not really going to benefit the podcasting platforms especially this rogan deal a licensing deal for three years is incredible you keep the fucking ip and you license it on spotify for three years only and then you get to do what you want after and you get 200 mil come on it's a no-brainer of course you take it which is why when he joined Spotify, um, he was he was willing to do whatever they wanted. Remember, he deleted a bunch of episodes and he lied about why he deleted them. He wouldn't have certain guests on. He basically ignored Brian Callen for like a year. Like, why wouldn't you? You got paid 200 mil. Do you know what I mean? Acquiesce. Bend over. Give them your asshole. Advertising. So using my advanced Googling skills, I typed in Spotify revenue breakdown. And here's what Google told me. Spotify segment breakdown, premium services 88%, ad supported services 12%. And then in gross profit terms, 95% for premium and 5% for ad supported services. So that means almost all of Spotify's revenue comes from their subscription service, which has nothing to do with podcasts. The only benefit of having Spotify premium is so you can fast forward through podcast ads. That's it. I'm not aware of any other benefit purely for listening to podcasts that you would get from having Spotify Premium. That's it. And the funny thing is, which I've got Spotify Premium, you can't even fast forward ads now. Some of the ads now are hard baked in and I, and I think they did it on purpose. On Spotify app, especially on your phone, if you're listening to the John Rogan podcast, there might be a hard, there might be like a, a baked in advert, advert on there, right? That you want to skip past an Athletic Greens advert or something. If you try and skip it, when if it does skip, for instance, it will make you go back to the start of the podcast, so you lose where you were. So some 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 ads you can skip, most of them you can't. But if you do try and skip them, it will make you go back to the start again. So it kind of like punishes you for trying to skip an ad. So now I don't skip them. I just if if an ad comes on, I just take off my headphones and let it play out. Honestly, man, fucking hate it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm I'm aware of that Uche um, YouTube Premium because of yeah free music yeah, honestly um, YouTube Premium has been the like not to fucking shill YouTube but this has been legitimately the best subscription I've ever done hands down more than Netflix anything I've got way more value out of YouTube Premium than I do with anything else because I'm literally I'll listen I listen to YouTube videos in the background uh, what you call it um, you know on my other time it's such a fucking lifesaver. It honestly is. Way more value I get out of that than fucking Spotify, to be fair. So yeah, big up everybody that told me to get YouTube Premium. Service is all focused on listening to music ad-free, creating playlists, etc., etc. But it gets worse. When you go from revenue to profit, it paints an even worse picture for podcasts on Spotify. Wow. They lose more than half the ad revenue in costs. Really? 12% versus 5% compared to their premium service, which only goes down from 95% to 88%. So not only is Bupper's claim that Rogan saved Spotify and added all this value to their share price completely false and has no basis in fact, he also has no idea how Spotify's business model works and where they make... Jesus Christ, he, he looked he looked awful. He, thank God he did the Ozempic. And that makeover has actually done it well. He looks much better now with the mullet and the trucker hat because... He was looking wild, isn't it? Ninety-five percent of their profit. But we should cut him some slack, right? Googling's hard, you know. That took me about three minutes. Anyway, enough business talk. Let's move into the final phase of this video: Bupper's fake comedy career. Joe Rogan really like shifted the mindset in comedy of like, we're not against each other, we're really together, and we can like a rising tide can lift all boats. Correct. He seemed to be like the tip of the spear on. Yep. That. Whoops, whoopsie, sorry. Yeah, but you know, he went to Rising Tide can lift all boats. Correct. He seemed to be like the tip of the spear on yep. that. Yep, and then he took that ship and, you know, he went to Austin. So that's the same yeah. philosophy out there in Austin. But, you know, now LA's like Game of Thrones because the king's <laughs> out it, you know, got his head cut off. <laughs> By head cut off, I mean he moved to Austin. Yeah, yeah. And then now, now it's back to survival of the fittest, oh. which is fine. That says a lot more about him, though. I think I said it before in the previous stream. If Rogan left and everything imploded for you, that says more about you and your dependency on Rogan than it does about Rogan or the comedy industry or the comedy scene. If he leaves and suddenly you think it's Game of Thrones or suddenly you're out in the lurch and you've been ostracized or maybe you're not, you know, hanging out. Because that's something you see a lot about Brendan also. He doesn't really hang out with comics as much. When he was with Rogan, you'd always see pictures of him with taking those corny black and white pictures with Bill Burr, all these type of people behind the, you know, the green room somewhere. But you don't really see that too often. He's not really hanging with people that much. I guess they don't want to hang with him, but that says more about him than it does about Rogan or the scene personally, I would think. I, you know, I can do both. Yeah, yeah. I can adapt with both. I'm both. down, but um, both. It was a better both. time when Rogan was in town. How was it different? Uh, it's just, you know, when you got a, a guy at that magnitude Helping going, me. this is how we do Keep it. My career. Everyone respects everybody. We support each other. It Brendan, Brendan plays at the comedy store. That's something I'd be annoyed at if I was Brendan. Rogan would let you come to the comedy store and perform with him, but then he moves to fucking Austin and suddenly he's got standards. I'd be annoyed. Even if I don't deserve it, as Brendan doesn't, the fact that Rogan went to Austin and suddenly he, he had a taste, he had taste level, he had uh, minimum requirements and stuff of what he needed the comics to be like to play his club. He suddenly had quality standards and shit, right? I'd be so furious because Rogan invited him to play with him at the comedy store, at the Ice House, Laugh Factory. Then he gets his own club. Nah, you're not funny enough in every way possible whether it's podcasts putting each other on shows like this is how we do it like people are like i guess that even if they didn't want it like yeah, that's what i gotta do if that's what the guy says and that's how yeah exactly uche yeah, sorry uche exactly josie that just goes to show that no one fucks with brendan he should have been able to make his own connections exactly but that's why i think that's the issue with hanging out with known comics obviously his ego is obviously crazy but i think when you hang out with known comics and you hang out with the big dogs the Joey Diaz's, the Joe Rogan's, the Bill Burr's. I think it's hard to then hang out with regular dudes and girls and be friends with them. It's almost impossible. You know what I mean? You're, you're already at a level of clout and fame. You think you're lowering yourself hanging out with those type of people. So that's probably what happened to him as well. He probably just found it hard to like click with those guys because he thought he's bigger than them, isn't it? And now he's basically having to pay the price he carries himself we're going to do the same so it was just a more welcoming time mm -hmm. then he leaves and that kind of standard's gone 
and you know, I, I, th you know, you still got the big boy. You know, you got uh, Santino and Bobby doing, you know, bad friends. You got When's the last time you seen Brendan with Andrew Santino? By the way, that's one person that definitely chose the side. Burt Kreischer, he just does his on his own. Segura's gone. Segura doesn't really hang out with Brendan anymore. Dio's gone. Tim Dio Dillon's in anymore. and out, right? Dylan, when's the last time Dylan's been on the show? Um, so it's just, it's just kind of everyone spread. So that kind of. You know, those kind of uh, unspoken rules are gone. Oh. Which is, you know, I'm down for the lawlessness of town. <laughs> I'm down for that. I'll survive in that. But it's just it's just not as fun, if that makes sense. Oh, man. I actually cannot believe he said those words out loud. Let's break this down. When Rogan was back in LA, there was an unsung rule that everyone helped each other out and had them on their podcasts. But now that he's left, it's back to every man for himself. So what that means is none of the LA crew have him on their shows anymore exactly. since Rogan left. I'm sure most of you know the story of how Brendan Schaub quit the UFC after Rogan told him on a live stream that he wasn't cut out for it, he's not an elite fighter, he's going to damage his brain even more than it already is. And then Rogan screwed us all by convincing Bapa he was funny and kept having him on his podcast over and over and over again until... I don't think that's fair, though. I know that's a, I know that's an adage people say, but I don't think you can blame Rogan for Brendan Schaub. I think Rogan's do, sh Rogan especially is doing what any good friend should do. If you have an opportunity to give your friends an opportunity to make some money, um, you know, to support themselves, to support their family, to make a you know a lane, have a career, whatever. I think you should do it. You should always try to do it. Um, I think that's a great, and I think. One thing about Rogan you have to give him credit for, he's the only one that did it at that level. Because I, I think if you give anybody in that comedy scene Rogan's fame, they wouldn't do what Rogan did with his platform. They wouldn't do it. So the fact that he did that and started it as a thing of like everyone comes on his show, they go to each other's show, they shoot the shit, they have these long form conversations. That's what obviously birthed that whole scene and these guys were helping each other. But it was him doing it. But I think you only have to bring Brendan for Brendan. You can't blame other people. Rogan did what any friend would do, but you only have to blame Brendan for Brendan because he's the one that took the opportunity and I completely pissed it up a wall. Do you know what I mean? That's his fault. I don't think that's Rogan's fault. I don't think that's fair. Well, finally, Brendan carved out his own little audience from Rogan's and he's managing to make a decent living from that to this day. But one thing that irritates me is that if Rogan thinks Schaub is so funny, why won't he let him do a set at his new comedy club in Austin? Have you been on his uh, mothership yet? I have not. I have not. I've. Uh... But that's the thing, Asad. That's a. I don't think that's a good point there. I don't think that's a good um, example. Not a good point. An example, probably. You said if I bring a drunk friend to a party, is, is it kind of on me? Because he didn't start off being a dick. Remember the Brendan that's the Brendan that got that started off early on Rogan was pretty decent. I remember there was a time when people used to like him on Rogan. They liked his early appearances. Then he slowly turned into a monster. So he let the fame, the clout, whatever, get to his head. He's the one that, he's damaged himself, not Rogan. So he's, he started off pretty decent and turned into a douchebag. Some people would argue, the Fire and the Kids subreddit guys would argue, that he was always a douchebag. He just hit it well. But again, Rogan met him. He was cool. Then he turned into a piece of shit. It's not, Rog it's not Rogan's fault. You bring someone to a party and they're chill and they get to a party and they're a piece of shit. That's not your fault for bringing them. It's just their fault for being a piece of shit and turning into one when they got the, at the rave. I think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I'm there Saturday, but when I come in, I'm there for the fight companion, and it, you know the cards out there start at nine. So we get done. You know, sometimes a three four hour show. So we we get done at one two in the morning, and I don't want to go up the you know the comedy the mothership when it's you know two in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. So we need to figure out the time where I'm not there doing shows. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just tough with my schedule. Um, exactly, I got a comment here from from uh, Jack Donahue Jr. Exactly, the Showtime deal broke his brain. That's that doesn't get spoken about enough. Like if you, if you're someone like Brendan that has a you're a bit of an egomaniac, you have an incredible you have delusions of grandeur, you're incredibly narcissistic, right? You have just a weird sense of self. You think you're smarter than what you are. Can you imagine how toxic and uh, almost destructive getting a deal like Showtime that early could be to your, to your psyche how it could actually fuck you up because 
that deal from Showtime is almost like validation. It's almost like, see, I told you I was a fucking genius. I told you I was a fucking savant. I told you I was special. I told you I was different. Because you get a Showtime deal when you're like a year and a half into stand-up. It can almost make you feel like, yeah, I was always destined for greatness. I was always a special. I knew it. I knew it. You guys didn't see it. I knew it. I knew it. So that could get to your head and it goes fucking crazy. So that Showtime deal, exactly, that created more of a monster than Rogan did. I think so. Especially if we believe what BGL says. He always thinks he's right. He thinks everyone else is wrong. He thinks he's way smarter than what he is. And then you finally get that deal that tells you you're smart. Because, you know, let's make let's also be real. Sometimes money and numbers are what they are, isn't it? It's kind of black and white. So sometimes someone can read the numbers and think, hey, if I'm worth 700, if if that baseball player is getting paid, is getting a 700 million contract, it's fair to him to assume that he might be the best player in baseball. He might not be, but it's fair to seem to assume it because he's got the highest contract. So I see why Brendan went crazy when he got that deal. Oops. Schedule too, like, I, don't get me wrong, I'd love to go there, love to perform, and we'll figure something out. But it's also, when Joe asks me, I'll be there, you know, but, but it's, 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 it's tough with my schedule. Gotcha. It's tough with his schedule, it's tough. And he also doesn't book it. You know, Adam Eget, who used to work at the store, books it. This lie it, is Adam's incredible. I've always so said that fucking thing. We just got to figure something out. You what know, an incredible that, that lie. Makes sense. Why, but, are you, why are you lying about this when you went on Skankfest and said why you can't perform this because you're not funny enough? You've got it on record, on video, where you said why you're not performing there. Now you're lying. Why? Uh, it, it's with kids, and it's just, I don't live the life of some of these comics, you know, in their 30s or in their 40s that don't have kids or don't have a wife where, man, if I was younger, if it was, you know, before my son came, oh, I'd be on a plane out there on a Tuesday night and, yeah. you know, having drinks off 6th Street and doing my thing. But now it's, it takes a lot for me to leave. I don't care what it is, man. Yeah. I don't care what it is. Like me and Bert, when I was on his show, had this conversation, you know, Bert's... Yeah, exactly. Obi. And that's... That's the real damaging part about Brendan, isn't it, right? Obi's right there. Obi says, um, Rogan won't let him headline at the mothership, but Joe said he can be an open micer. Brendan's ego won't let him do it. He will only perform at Rogan's club if he's headlining. Exactly. Somebody leaked that information. I forgot who. I think it might have been on the subreddit when it first opened. I think somebody basically said, hey, Rogan's never performed. I mean, Brendan's never performing there. It's pretty much certain. I think some comedians also you know, pulled Rogan to a side and told him, hey, this guy can't perform here. How damaging it is for this guy to get gigs and he's not even good and shit. You know, I think that's what, I think, I think Rogan had a bit of an awakening and was told some harsh truths about Brendan. And maybe he also realized that he, he in part created a bit of a monster himself. But I do remember seeing that on a, on, somewhere in the Reddit, I think. Someone saying, yeah, he was told you could be an open micer. You can start from the bottom and work your way up. And Brendan said no. Which is kind of a, is a representation of why he's where he's at and why he's never going to change and why he's a lost cause, really. You'd think that's a great opportunity to you to kind of reset your career, especially comedy-wise, and sort of give yourself a clean slate and start again? Nah, I'm too big for that. Started crying, you know, because Bert's the best in the world, man. <laughs> he's the absolute best guy in the world. But, you know, he, he tours different. He gets a tour bus. He's gone for, you know, weeks, months at a time. And he did that even when his kids were young. And so I was asking about his movie, and this is before it came out. And he's like, hopefully with the, you know, the Russia war, who knows, man, it kind of screws me over. I'm like, oh, that's terrible, man. It's like your big break, not that you need it. Everybody knows who you are. But when you make a movie about your, your the machine store, it's a big deal. He's like, I know. And I'm like, how long were you out there? He's like, man, I was in... Uh, wherever they shot in Russia. He's like, I don't know, like four or five months. I'm like, God, oh, that's insane. He's like, let me ask you this. I know you're a homebody and you got kids. If they asked you to do a movie, but you couldn't see your kids for four, you know, to six months, what you do? I'm like, no, no, mm. I wouldn't do it. He's like, you're telling <laughs> me on, if they're like, hey, it can be Batman, <laughs> but you can't such have a liar, six man. Months. As like, if Brendan would reject the role to Batman. Not, I've just gotten to this level. It's not a success level. Maybe it's a maturity level. Now nothing's worth missing the time. You leave for a week and if you have a two or three year old they're completely different man you're missing that stuff mm. it's just not that's where i'm at man so brendan Schaub hasn't performed at the comedy mothership because he has kids <laughs> like seriously that was the most incoherent answer i've ever heard how quickly did he change the subject to bert kreischer and his machine movie bro the guy's worse than me with bert what are you talking about it's a comedy club. You're not Batman. <laughs> and he even let it slip that he hasn't been asked to go and perform there. 
Imagine being such a close friend with someone. I mean, according to Bupper, him and Rogan text every day, but he won't even let you perform at his comedy club, and that's what your main profession is. I think if I'm Chris D'Elia, I've got an issue as well with Rogan a little bit. Because I think it's almost impossible that Rogan didn't see some of the fuck shit Chris D'Elia was doing in clubs. It's almost impossible he didn't see it. Because I remember that being a running gag before Chris got discovered to be a bit of a diddler and maybe a borderline PDFL. People would always say that he'd always have like girls at his show, right? I remember people would always say he was one of the only comedians that would have like, you know, groupies hanging around and shit. Wanting to see him after the show, get him to sign something. And he always complained about how annoying it was, right? It's kind of a running gag. All these girls are here only to see Chris. So I find it impossible to believe that Rogan didn't see any of the fuck shit or didn't see some of the girls especially if they were young and stuff so for rogan to completely ice chris must have hurt even though he's a he's a piece of shit he's a douchebag you know that probably hurt and he hasn't mentioned him either i don't think he talks about chris Alia. he's never been on his podcast again he's not gonna put his, like, he's, like, he's completely excommunicated him it's gonna be a, it's gonna be tough pill to swallow that one the funny thing is, Bupper's actually been inside the comedy club and hung out in the green room, but he hasn't actually done a set there. Oh, man. <laughs> it gets me every time when he runs with that story about not being able to tee up a time. Oh, but if Rogan asked me to perform there, I'd do it. Bro, what? Which one is it? Oh, man. I don't want to spend time away from my kids. Jeez, this guy. Anyway, I think one of the best parts of this interview, though, was when Joel puts Bupper on the spot about why he rushed his comedy career so much and why he put out a special after only and by the way let's also be known i don't think podcast chris knows about the video clip but there's a video clip that i'll probably put in here when i do the clip myself of brendan admitting on on fucking Skankfest. he went to fucking Skankfest in las vegas and he admitted without even anybody asking him he offered up the information himself he wanted to share and now looking back at it he shared it and he was honest about it because he wanted a crowd on his side he offered them a little carrot. He offered up the information that I'm not performing at the comedy store because I'm not funny enough. And when I get funny enough, I'll be able to perform there. He did it in a bit of a self-gratifying way. He made it sound like he told Rogan, look, man, I can't perform there yet. I'm not funny. I want to get back to being funny again and I'll go. He d he made it seem like that. He made it seem like it was his choice when really it seems like Brent Rogan told him, no, start as an open mic and then work your way up. And he said, nah. So he already admitted why he can't perform there only a couple of years in the game he caught Shaw off guard here and left him literally speechless for a few seconds the advice i would have exactly this is really for good. comics this is really like good. learn from me man this as far really as there's no rush there's this no really, you're gonna really see good. these comics posting clips on social media and really that's good. the trendy thing to do and you see everyone doing it. everyone's really posting good. crowd work because really they want to ruin their whatever their 15 minutes this or 30 really minutes good. or this their special really material good. and you see all this crowd work and I don't, I don't have the answer. Do something different. Everyone's doing that. Do something different. And also, don't be in a rush to get that stuff out. Like let, let it build. Like for me, and I had advice from Rogan, from Brian. Like don't do a special yet. Wait. Uh, with with uh, my other special with the Green Girl Poppy. Everyone's like, oh, I got two million views. Yeah, I, I would have waited on all of it. I would have waited till I got 10, 10 years. <laughs> and there's a reason they say that. Exactly. So it's like don't be in a rush. He's I know it's gonna be tempting. Because you want to get it out there. You see all your friends doing or comics you look up okay. to do it. Don't be in a rush. Okay. Mm -hmm. do, do the, do, do, just wait, man. Just wait. Just wait. There's no advantage to doing it early. There's absolutely zero advantage. So why didn't you wait? <laughs> uh, I didn't wait. That's Where a good money? question. Where the money? Um, it's tough. And, you know, put yourself in my shoes. You're two years into comedy. Showtime comes to you. <laughs> Be patient. Take your time. Why did you take your time? Uh... <laughs> that was fucking brilliant. That was so good. That was so fucking brilliant. That was so good. It deserves a replay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Absolutely zero advantage. So why didn't you wait? Uh, I didn't wait. That's a good question. Um... It's tough. And, you know, put yourself in my shoes. You're two years into comedy. Showtime comes to you, offers you this amount of money. More money than I ever made in the UFC. More money than I was making a podcast and offers you to do this 
hour that you've been doing, you know, for two years, you're like, yeah, why not? Mm-hmm. Why not? You know, and I was like, oh, this would be cool. People will realize I've only been doing it for two years. Fast comic ever get a major network special, they're going to celebrate this. No, but this is the thing that I hate how he twists it. He didn't think this. He actually thought he was funny. That's a funny, that's a really sad and tragic part of this story. He took the Showtime deal, of course, for the money. We can say now, you know, with um, hindsight, it was a bad idea. At the time, it was still a bad idea. But he actually thought he was funny. And if you remember correctly, I think, if you remember properly, after Showtime, he refused to upload clips. Because of the negative reaction he got from that UB Surprise special, I remember... That's when the whole trend of like posting clips started with shots and all these other people posting clips, but he refused to upload them because of the negative reaction he got to sh- to that special. So he didn't know how bad he was at stand up. He had no idea. He thought he was good. So when that special came out, we all saw it. And we everybody commented and said this is terrible, and it's been voted as the with the worst rated special ever. That's when he realized how terrible he was, and maybe then he realized it was a bad decision. But at the time, he thought he was. I remember him saying on podcast TV, he thought. Um, he said something like, oh, my path to comedy is different. I don't need to do like open mics. He basically, he basically insinuated he doesn't, he doesn't need to do the, the process the way everyone else does it. He can do it another way. And like his way is better, basically. And, you know, so far. No, no that's, <laughs> that's not how this works. <laughs> that, what? No, we're not normal human beings. Nobody. Yes, no, that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to despise you for yeah. it. They're going to hate you for it. Yeah, I, yeah. Didn't really, I didn't see that coming. Uh-huh. And also, if you remember, again, to an added bit of law, when he got the Showtime deal, he was letting his nuts hang. He didn't have the Showtime deal and he was super humble about it. He was kind of like, yeah. And I remember there was a time when he was like saying stuff like, I've got like an athlete's mindset, you know, with comedy. I do sets and reps and all this sort of shit. So it was sort of like a validation that showtime deal that he's special his path is different he's like a you know he's a fucking you know he's leading the charge for this alternative way to get there was something that he was very egotistical about it it wasn't like he got it like oh yeah i'm humble i'm just gonna do this special i'm gonna do this material i've been doing it for a couple of years anyway i'm just gonna get it out there give it to the people no it wasn't a humble thing he was letting his nuts hang with that special he really was Huh. All good. I have big shoulders for a reason. I was built for this hate. It, yeah. it doesn't affect oh, me. Oh, cringe. But yeah. I don't like it, you know, and I you know, I wish I could change some things, but it is what it is. But I have thick skin. So, um, yeah, I just, I didn't see that coming. I was like, oh, really? You guys? Oh, okay. But and then but then I put myself in their shoes. Like, dude, that guy over there was doing it for 15 years and got a network special. Like, yeah, man, he's not going to like that. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I get it. I get it. And I have no, I have no ill will towards any of those. Yeah, you people. do. I get it. Hang on, uh, I thought Brendan didn't do things for money. What happened to that mantra? Dude, get your story straight. Imagine that, that, you'd be surprised. This is part of the promotion, by the way. Look at the money that went into UB Surprise. He had a, a professional photographer. Look at these pictures. This is actually a really nice picture. A black and white picture of him and Brian hugging in the green room and then Rogan sitting there. He had a professional photographer come out and take pictures. He had a... Someone deleted it from the internet, but I wish someone could find a, 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 a an original copy of it. But Brendan put together this like little documentary before the special came out, where he had the camera guy follow him around, go to his house, see him write in. Like it was like a little thing, but that got that got taken off the internet. That doesn't exist anymore. But he spent a lot of money on that shit. He thought it was gonna be the thing that was gonna blow him up, and it happened to be one of the biggest mistakes of his career, bro. Just too soon. Just wait. If he would have waited just two more years, it would have been fine probably would have been a, a little bit better but i i don't believe that to be fair because i'm so, i'm one of the people that believe that you'd be surprised is a better special than google pappy and google pappy was like what five years later straight and that whole thick skin story bro you're suing a youtuber you threaten bobby lee's ex-girlfriend kalila for saying mean things about you on her exactly. podcast exactly. you have the thinnest skin in the game exactly. the thinnest. now look This has been a long video, so I'm going to tie it up with this. Shorb still does not understand why he receives so much hate. When it comes to the comedy community, the reason is simple. They feel like his career was artificially boosted by being one of Rogan's best friends when he clearly just isn't funny. And you have to remember, this is something that many people don't realize. Bubba hasn't just had a few appearances on JRE here and there. 
Over the years, get this, he's had over 130 appearances. Mm -hmm. The exposure that Rogan has given him has been... 130? I didn't even know that. That is a crazy amount. And it's funny because he's the least... He's the least open and honest about the impact Rogan's played in his career. Even though the likes of Tim Dillon, Mark Norman, Ari Shafir, all these other guys who have met Rogan and their careers have gone crazy, they're way more open and honest about how beneficial it's been to be Rogan's friend. They will talk about it openly. But Brennan's the one that's got the most appearances out of all those guys, but he's the one that tries to like diminish it and play it down. Like, no, no, no. You know what I mean? It wasn't that big of a... It didn't play that... It's like, come on, brother. Come on. Come on. In absolutely mind-blowing. That's why comics hate him. He's had millions upon millions upon millions of dollars in free advertising just by going on JRE. Exactly, Assad. He's not even on the show anymore. He still has the highest appearances. And he probably will... It probably will be like that for a long time. I can't imagine another person who's going to take over from him in that regards because Rogan doesn't really have guests on like that anymore. He has repeat guests, but not the way he used to have with Brendan because they were actually friends. Read that many times. But that's just the comedy community. For the rest of us, he's simply just not entertaining. I mean, the guy's clearly an idiot. He can't speak properly. He can't think clearly. He makes up facts. He tries too hard. He's a bully if he doesn't get his way. He just does not belong on a stage or behind a mic or in front of a camera or basically just anywhere in public okay. view. <laughs> I almost feel like apologizing to you guys <laughs> for thinking that he was on his redemption arc. After this interview with Joel, I was reminded of exactly... I mean, precisely why I started disliking this guy in the first place. I guess it's true that you've just got to trust your first instincts. Exactly. Anyway, that's my break. Exactly. And that's the thing with Brendan. Like, there are times when you think he's gonna he's turned over a new leaf. But I think with most people in life, and I think it's, it's, it's something that you can be applied to life in general. When people show you who they are, believe them. When people show you who they are, believe them. And I don't think it's... This is a controversial statement I'm going to make here, but... I don't think it's a crime to be a piece of shit. Brendan is a piece of shit. He's a bully. He's a liar. He's a cheater. Whatever, all this other shit. It's not a crime to be those things. The annoying thing is that he thinks he's the greatest guy in the world. That's the annoying thing about it. Right? That's the really, you know, insufferable, tiring, whatever thing about it. That he actually thinks he's the best guy in the world. But he is not the best guy in the world <laughs> clearly and many people agree you know there's many people out there that make content every single day saying the same thing so you know it's when he when he does go into some of his redemption tours like even the the skank fest thing everyone was making out that he turned a new leaf and it was all over nah nah nah, nah. but yeah big up podcast scrooge absolutely a brilliant brilliant video subscribe to his channel man absolute g i love the um the lawyer breakdown as well in between there as well breaking down how that interview could have fucked his case with fucking unique which is typical brendan to be honest but hey let's see how this plays out big up podcast cringe big up podcast cringe yeah exactly he's too old to change and i've always had controversial statement about change anyway i don't believe people can change i've always said it anyway i think usually over if you're over the age of 25 you just are what you are and people have to, like, I think I say it because of friends. Sometimes I have a lot of friends that will, co will come to me and complain about other friends that we have in our group. And I'll be like, look, this is, this is just who they are. If you're someone's friend, you have to just accept sometimes that they might have some annoying habits and stuff that they say that you don't like. But if they're your friend, you have to be willing to put up with the annoying things because the positives far away the negatives. And after the age of 25, most people aren't going to change. They have no reason to. Um, some people just don't want to change or they don't see the need to change. So, you know, it's just a waste of time thinking of that or trying to force them into think or force them into doing that. So when people go out here trying to say, oh yeah, Brendan's going to change, it's like, no, why would he change though? So far, life has given him everything he wanted, right? He values money and all this sort of stuff very highly in status. He's give, given all those things over the years, despite all these character flaws, he has no incentive to change. Zero. Zero incentive to change. So I get it. I get it. I completely get it. But yeah, be at Postcard Scrooge.